I'm Apostle T.B. Walker, and I want to welcome you to Live at 5. It's Wednesday. It's 5 o'clock. So we are here live at 5. I'm excited about each and every one that's going to hear of this video and hear what's going on. I'm coming to you today from Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm out of town right now, but it's been an awesome, awesome trip. I've had a chance to, uh, to, to really set up some great, great uh, potential interviews for, for the future. But I've had a chance to really look at a, uh, a, a, an awesome, awesome entrepreneur today. I met with a brother by the name of Robert McCrary. And uh, Robert McCray, and actually, you know, he's known by Chief. He he is the actual founder of Live Alkaline uh, Water. He owns a thousand acres in uh, in the town that he lives in, uh, and he owns the water that's there. It's been in his family for 450 years. Such an awesome historical. Um, it's such an awesome historical story and a historical saga because his family has been here. He is an African uh, an American. Well, he's a black man, uh, also with indigenous background, and his family has owned this land for 450 years. There's a great deal of history here. Uh, you know, again, he's the first, this is the first black owned water company that was, is in Walmart. And so he's doing great, great things. There's so many things that are on the horizon. Had a great opportunity to sit down and talk to him today to talk a little bit about the future. And I'm just so impressed by the fact that not only is he doing such great things uh, for his family, for himself, for his community, but he's opening up this lifestyle. It's a, it's a, I mean, they're, they're living off the grid, they're completely self sufficient. And, you know, when I got a chance to see the property and see the land, see even a portion of the business, it is just phenomenal. And so it's wonderful to see, you know, so many great things and be able to see people that are, you know, in our time right now in this wonderful time of Black History Month to be able to see living legends and, and real history happening right in front of our faces. Uh, so I'm once again, I'm glad to have you here. Glad that you're watching us here on Live at Five. Uh, you know, one of the things that we do here at Live at Five is I want to give you a preview of our Bible study and where we're going. We're doing an awesome study in Genesis. And I'm certainly, um, you know, as we look in this book of Genesis, there are some things that are happening, in, especially in chapter four, that are really astounding. You know, one of the things that I want to bring up to you today that I'm, I, I may not cover tomorrow on Thursday at our Bible study, so I want, to, I want to give it to you today, is just this question that's asked that I think is really, really so powerful. That question that, that is asked by God is this to Cain. He says, he says, where is your brother Abel? Now, you know, when you begin to really look at the question that's really asked here of God, you can almost hear an echo chamber. You know, there is clearly here in the very conscience of Cain, the question, and I'm sure that even the guilt and even some shame at this point concerning what he's done. Cain is in hiding mode. We can tell by the answer that he later gives. And Cain is in a really dangerous place of deluding himself. You know, you can lie long enough where the real issue is not whether you're lying to somebody else, but it's the lie you tell to yourself. God comes now, he says, where is your brother Abel? Now, you know, interesting thing about this, God knowing everything, he doesn't say, you know, you, the brother that you had. He deals with Abel as his brother right now. Where is the brother that you have still? Where is the brother that you grew up with? Where is the brother that you shared the same womb with, that learned worship from the same father? Where is that brother now? And he's using this to show the aggravation of the crime. It's not just a standard murder as we see it right now, but it has aggravating circumstances. So when you look at this, he's also reminding Cain of the obligation that he has as a brother, you know, that, that, that the care and the love and the guidance and the nurturing that he's supposed to have for his younger brother. And so he's echoing these words to Cain. And, and so Cain may have felt it in his heart. He may have felt it in his conscience. We know that later that conscience is going to be burned and seared. But at this point, God is still offering him an opportunity to come clean. And, you know, the interesting thing about this is that this is divinely placed right in front of Cain by God. Not so Cain can confess it so much to God who already knows it, but so that Cain can be confronted by himself with himself. The truth of the matter is the greatest delusion is not to God because you cannot delude God. God who knows everything 
uh, that, that is aware of everything before it even happens, it's impossible to trick him. It's impossible to lie to him and it's impossible to delude him. But it is very possible to trick yourself. It's very possible to lie to yourself and it's very possible to delude yourself. And one of the things that we know about, about scripture and, and concerning life is that sin that is not confronted is not going to be overcome. And that is really an important lesson here. And God is aware of the strong will of Cain. You know, he's aware of, you know, of the fact that Cain has an adversary. He tells Cain, you know, listen, I'm telling you right now, sin's crouching at the door. That's what he tells Cain before this. He says, listen, sin is crouching at the door and, and it wants to take over you, but you must master it. Cain has a strong will and he has power within his own constitution where God is saying, now use that power right. Well, Cain now uses that opposition power that he possesses, but he uses it to oppose God. He doesn't hear the word of God. He refuses to hear the word of God and it's manifested in his uh, answer back to God. What do I have to do with the whereabouts of my brother? Is he my responsibility? Listen, that's a question that's reverberated throughout time since he spoke those words. Is my brother my responsibility? Am I responsible for his actions? Is Does my guidance and my light matter to concerning where my brother goes in his life? That's an important question. And, and listen, it, it, there's a lot there to contemplate. And I think that when you begin to look at this, one of the reasons why Cain is uh, directly confronted is because the answer is really yes. The answer is, yeah, you are supposed to be responsible for your brother. You actually are your brother's keeper. Listen, we're going to go deeper into that on Thursday, but I'm certainly glad to be able, that you're here. And it's something that I think needs to be dealt with. And we've got to really look at that because that question has reverberated down throughout the ages. And there are moments when we're told, you know, don't get weary in well-doing. Well, you know, we asked that very same question. People get on my nerves. Are, am I responsible for them? I'm tired of being a leader. I'm tired of being a role model. I'm tired of being a light. Well, you can't, when the Bible says don't get weary in well-doing, you know, it has Abel in mind. You know, it has those people that are presented and positioned to be a light to the world, a, a position as cities on a hill that cannot be hidden. And the reality is that, yes, you do have a responsibility for the people around you. Yeah, your actions actually matter. What you say can corrupt or uplift other people. Yeah, there's a lot to get into. So I hope you're here with us tomorrow at 730 because we're really going to have a great study and I don't want you to miss it. Listen, you know, part of what we do here at Live at Five is that there's three questions that are asked of me, and, and I'm calling this this segment, actually, Ask the Apostle. So I want to give you these three questions. I want to share this with you. These are sent to me and uh, and for, for answers. Some people are asking me answers and saying, listen, I need you to answer this right now. But these, but some people will send me questions and say, save it this for Live at Five. So I've got three questions that people have asked me, and they've asked me specifically, save this one for Live at Five. So here we go. I want to give this to you. Here's the first question. Can a person who doesn't spend time with God know when he's speaking to him and should they act when they don't get an answer? Now, I'm assuming that the person that you're asking, that you're asking for or that you're talking about is praying for something, right? They're, and they're asking something from God and based upon the portion that you asked at the very end is that should they act if they don't, you know, get an answer? Well, listen. Here's a, the first thing that needs to be known is that it is an impossibility to really know someone that you don't spend any kind of quality time with. A relationship does require time. Now, that time is not essential because it's obligatory. It's not, this can't be done out of obligation. True relationships are not built that way. They're built by a true desire for, you know, from both people to know each other. Now, obviously God, and this is interesting because God desires fellowship with us even though he knows us by, he's numbered every hair on our head. He knows our, our getting up and our, ride and, our, and our sitting down. So, so he knows everything about us and he created us, yet he still wants a relationship with us. And so for that relationship to work, we have to have that very same desire for him. So, and, and I think another revelation to help answer that is that a confession of faith, baptism of the Holy Spirit will change our spiritual condition, but it by itself, that, that, that 
moment by itself, which is still an act of God done before the very foundation of the world, drawn and called before we were ever formed, in no way means that because we have a change in condition, that somehow we know more about the Lord, that, that a person can actually have a confession of faith and be baptized in the Holy Spirit by the Holy Spirit and yet still not know any more about Christ than the thief on the cross did. Still, he's, the Lord says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. So why? How can that be? Well, God's still able to draw us. He doesn't need us in truth. You know, even the drawing of us is not something that he needs us to do. He never, he doesn't need us to wave our hand and say yes and have a, an agreement. There's some things that are going to happen, but he doesn't need us. God is able to direct us and guide us and strengthen us and empower us, whether we spend quality time with him or not. So that's clearly not really the issue. And I'm making the assumption that this person is asking in faith, even though they're ignorant of the true self of the creator, right? That, that's what's there. But one of the things you got to understand is that spending time with God looks different for everybody. Everybody has a different way of uh, spending time with God. Everybody has a different way. Some people use music. Some people will worship. Some people will praise. Some people will study. There's a multitude of ways. Some people will meditate. So there's a lot of ways of spending time with God. But there's a couple things that, that, that are there that you just cannot really have without knowing God. You can't hear God truly without these two uh, articles. And I think that first one is the Bible. The Bible is the living, active word of God. It's, it is the the perfect mode is the clearly clearest way that God speaks to his people because it's right there. It's written, it, you know, it, 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 it's unchangeable. So it's also the greatest description and clearest, truest description we have of God by God coming to us, you know, himself. So no matter what stage we are in our walk, no matter where we are in our life, everyone can build their relationship and increase their relationship and expand their relationship by reading the word of God. The second portion is by prayer. You know, this person has to not only study the word of God, but they've also got to pray because it's our direct connection to the Lord. Let me read something in Philippians chapter four, verse six. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So. What's the answer? You know, I, I, maybe I've gone around the bush here. What's the final answer? Well, listen, here's a general answer that I'll give you. It's dangerous to identify with anything without you continue your education about that thing that you are identifying with. It is dangerous for a Christian to attempt to follow Christ without expanding our knowledge and our relationship with Christ. You know, Christianity is not an intellectual pursuit. It's a lifestyle. And it's impossible for you to style your thinking around something whose mind you don't know. Let me give you this final scripture, and I hope this will help you understand this. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You cannot possibly know him. You cannot possibly follow him. You will not be able to hear him clearly if you do not have the mind of Christ, because even with truth, with an opposition mind, that mind will simply reject the truth. So my hope is that there's a great, there's some answers here that are, that are in there that will really help you and be able to help your the person that you're asking for, because they're obviously moving without knowing and without uh, knowing Christ and Christ can guide them without them actually truly knowing him, but for their own sake and for the sake of their relationship and for the sake of a, their own clarity, where the enemy cannot come in and confuse, it's necessary for them to build on that relationship through prayer and through the reading of the word. Let's look at question number two. I have heard that everyone has to confess Christ as Lord or they will be forever damned. What about people who have never heard of Christ? How can God be merciful, a merciful God if he will punish people for ignorance and not willful unbelief? Great question. I like that. I've, I've, I've asked that question a time or two myself in the past, and I've had to study that to really get a solid answer on that. And you know what? In doing the study, some of that answer, the answer has evolved. It kind of started out really, really simple. 
And then, you know, later, you know, and it started out with the, what really comes down to be the true answer, which is that we've got to trust God to do what's right, right? That's the real true ending answer is that there's some things we don't know about. There's some things that aren't actually totally explained to us, but the nature of God is explained to us. We know that he's the giver of every good and perfect gift and that he's just, right? So with that, there, in these situations that are really difficult, we've got to understand and trust that God, who is right and just, will do the right thing and judge rightly because of who he is. But let me read a couple things here. I want to give you a couple scriptures here because there's two passages in Romans that might give us a little revelation. It reads, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Let me read this. That's Romans 120. Let me read this next one. This is Romans 2, chapter 4, uh, Romans chapter 2. This is verses 14 through 15. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. So they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts either accusing or defending them. Now, let's take those all together. If we bring those two scriptures together, we find out that there's two things that God is telling us about humanity, that he has given everybody an inherent knowledge of God, of him, right? An inherent knowledge, not gospel knowledge, not specific knowledge that, that many of us know through study, but an inherent knowledge of a God existence. That's one of the things that the scripture shows us. And it is clearly seen again through nature. So when you look at the very first scripture that I've read in Romans chapter one, verse 20, it talks about from that God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what was made. So we recognize that God is saying, no, 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 I've placed nature in place so that there is a revelation of me through nature. And then he says, and when the Gentiles actually do the law, never having ever heard the law, they honor their mother and their father. They love their neighbor as themselves. They do these very same things that are written in this law that only people who would have been connected to the Mosaic law and even gospel, even gospel, they are doing the very things that they had never actually heard. It says that they that shows that there's a law written on their hearts that can't be done by man. That's got to be done by God. And it says that even their consciences, not their soul, not their spirit, but their very conscience begins to bear witness to what's going on in their hearts. And they judge one way or the other, negative or positive, accusing or defending based upon that inherent knowledge that's been placed there by God. So it means that they know that God exists, right? It, they know that there is a moral standard and they are aware when they break that moral standard because it says their conscience will either accuse or defend. So now, according to the scripture that we look at and according to what we know about the Bible, that they... God, the concept of God is not a ph philosophical concept at all, right? This whole idea about whether God will speak or not is not philosophical. God has testified himself through cre creation. You know, God speaking or not speaking, God is saying, listen, I've testified to this directly to the mind of man, to the degree that everybody knows something about God and that everybody has access to to some knowledge concerning God. Now, in the question, we've got to make a correction. In the question, it appears that there's an indication that there's a belief that salvation or, or damnation, eternal damnation, is based upon the idea that at some point a person has heard the gospel and rejected it. Damnation then would be based upon rejecting the good news, rejecting the gospel. Well, listen, here's the truth. Of this and listen it's it's a it's a construct you know we construct this and this question that you know was, is asked here 
was asked by me. You know, this was asked by, I'm sure, by many people, but it doesn't take into account the true doctrine that we actually serve and are under. The doctrine is this. We are not eternally damned because at some point we rejected the gospel. We are born in sin. We are born in this damned place. We are born in sin and shapen in iniquity. So we're born under a death sentence. Th that's the reality. So, you know, we're not, we're not looked upon and we're not eternally damned. We don't are not in a position even to need to be saved because I need to hear the gospel. I need to be saved because I am born in a sinful, disconnected place with God that I cannot possibly breach or get back to him from without the gospel. So when you begin to look at this, we are born rebels. We are born in a place where we're at enmity with God. So the, the gospel is not part of the problem. It is the remedy. It's not the reason. It's the remedy. So, so what's the final answer to that question? Well, it's clear that there are people who have never heard of the gospel before, but the biblical doctrine absolutely denies and dismisses that there are actually people who've never heard of God. And, and, and that's really the question that you're asking. What happens to those people? Well, there's plenty of people who have never heard the gospel. So what happens to those people that have never heard the gospel? Well, they've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they've actually heard about God and they've heard who he is and the Lord had, will account their faith in that word that he's placed in their heart unto them as righteousness in the same way he did Abraham. Abraham did not know about Jesus. He had never heard of this Emmanuel, the prophecy that was coming, that is given to us by Isaiah. Uh, Abraham precedes Isaiah. He comes before him. So Abraham does not heard, does, has never heard the gospel, but the Lord, he has heard the word from God. And the Lord said to Abraham, to Abraham and he says it to us, that he accounts that faith that Abraham placed in that, in that word that he heard from God. He says he accounts that unto him as righteousness. So my hope is that you'll understand here is that the Bible actually says, no, there's nobody that's actually never heard of God. Nobody. So evangelism is a wonderful tool. And evangelism is a tool that where people can hear but it is not the only tool that is used. The Holy Spirit precedes us and does work that we can't see. And the Lord has promised that he has made sure that he has revealed himself and his isness and the truth concerning his existence to all mankind. To all mankind. So we don't die because we reject the gospel. We die because we reject the revelation of the truth of the Lord. Hopefully that answers that question. Listen, we've got one more question here. I'm a Christian, a vegan, and a fitness instructor. I like it. I believe the body to be the temple of God and where the Holy, Holy Ghost dwells. If my body is the temple of God, then isn't it a grave sin if I don't eat healthy or treat my body with respect? Great question, and I like it. Listen, you're absolutely right. The scripture tells us this, that our body is God's temple. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, look at it, starting at verse number 19 and in verse number 20. You'll find that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of a believer. We know that. So after we accept Jesus Christ in our heart, God gives us his spirit to lead us and guide us. And so that spirit dwells in our body, dwells within us. Though the spirit doesn't live in our arms or doesn't live like within the fleshly realm, but though the Bible clearly says that this temple, this, this body encases the, the Holy One that lives on the inside of us. So since God has now bought us with a price because, you know, we don't receive that without there having been shed blood. And because of the shed blood of Jesus on the cross for our sins, then, yeah, we need that we're obligated by God to take care of our body, which is his temple. Now, I want to read something to you. This is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's what the scripture actually tells us. So it directly connects to your question. It says, and you know, it's, it's interesting that he says, you know, whatever you do, but he makes it, it says, in your eating and your drinking, all that we do is meant to glorify God. Now, obviously, these are not bodies that are fit for heaven. Obviously, these are bodies that are going to die. And obviously, 
based upon scripture and what we know, God is much more interested in our spiritual health than our physical well-being. But that doesn't mean, it doesn't negate in any way that God wants us to be physically healthy. He says it. I want you to be in health and prosper, even as your soul prospers. So when we abuse our bodies, when we eat things we're not supposed to eat, when we operate and live lives of poor hygiene, substance abuse, uh, self-harm, you know, when you look at uh, junk food junkies, uh, addicts of any type, they're, they, no, we, when you do that, you're not taking care of your body. You're not taking care of your temple. And, and that's a, a, a great injustice to you. The truth of the matter is it isn't necessarily a harm to God. Uh, it isn't, well, you know, the Lord can't use me in this case. Well, the Lord can use you. I mean, he can certainly, you know, make use of your mouth if you can't move. Or, you know, he can make use of your wisdom if you just are so overweight that you can't even get around. You know, God can still use you. So that's not the issue. But there are greater issues that are there that, that are we don't want our good evil spoken of. Listen, legally speaking, to answer your question, um, you know, eating junk food, I know you're, you're a fitness instructor, you're instructor, you're vegan, uh, lacking exercise, you know, you, I'm sure that you can't stand the very thought of a couch potato. And listen, and I, and I get it, you know, so a person who just, just Doritos all day long and, you know, wham whams and zoom zooms all in their mouth all day long, that person who's just sitting there and sedentary and just refusing to do any exercise at all to exercise their body. Um, yeah, you know what? You're describing someone who's disrespecting the body, but legally there's no sin there. You know, if we looked at this from a legal standpoint, and when I say legal, I mean the laws of the word. There Legally, there isn't a sin. So, no, there's there's no sin there. But understand, understand this, here's the thing. When we treat our bodies badly and we stuff anything in our mouths and we suffer from substance abuse or we're addicted to sweets and all those kind of things, here's what we are doing. We're showing poor stewardship. Listen, it's your body. What is thine is thine. Though you've been bought with a price, free will and God has not come and said, I'm taking that. Never. He says, give me that. And that's the difference. When I use my body in this way, it shows that I'm not yielding what I could give to God for his use. And you know what it does? It doesn't have eternal weight. It's not going to send you to hell un under any circumstances. But what it will do is it can mess up your witness. It can certainly, sh it certainly shows poor stewardship and it can certainly dim the light and the glory that, that literally you can give to God through the use of your body. He says, listen, in, in your drinking and everything you do, do it to the glory of the Lord. And one of the things that happens when we're sloppy, when we're lazy, when we're listless because of our eating habits, when our bodies are out of shape, and when we simply seem like we don't care about ourselves, it dims this great light that God has given us that not only rejuvenates us spiritually, but it also is meant for us to shine physically. We're designed to shine. So I want you to understand something. In this answer, no, it's not a grave sin, but it's a grave self-injustice and it is self-harm. And though it does not have eternal weight, and though that person may not uh, look at themselves and say, I need to repent because I'm eating too many of these uh, tasty cakes. No, but they may have to look at themselves and recognize I'm shortening and I'm dishonoring and I'm veiling the glory that God wants to shine through me, not just through my words, not just through the light that's behind my eyes, but also in the light that is my eyes. Because if I'm not taking care of myself, then I won't look right. And therefore, even the distorted image can actually cause confusion. And God is not the author of confusion. So listen, my hope is that you were blessed by uh, these questions today. And I listen, I want to thank everyone for sending in their questions. Do, listen, don't hesitate. I've got plenty of questions, but I'm going to always need more. Uh, you know, so please do not hesitate to send me your questions and send me your feedback too. I want to know if I'm helping you with this, if these questions are 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 
being answered to your satisfaction. And if, and if there's more that's needed, listen, let's get together offline because we can, I can certainly continue the study with you to kind of, to help you to be able to see these answers more clearly. And listen, but if these, are, if this has been a blessing to you, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Let me know in the comments. You can reach out to me directly through my email, apostletbwalker at gmail.com, or you can reach me right here at Facebook, or you can reach me on our, our on my website at disciplesoffaith.life. Either way, I want to make sure you're educated because I really believe that the most powerful believer is an educated believer, and that education is through the Word of God. Listen, this is Live at Five. I've had an awesome time being with you today, and I'm going to be back again with you on Wednesday, but we're going to be back again at 7 o'clock because I've got an awesome, awesome interview with a brother by the name of King. you got to check it out here at 7. Take a look uh, at the um, at the flyer that we have out here. This guy is an educator, he's an entrepreneur, and he's a community organizer. I'm, I'm meeting so many people, and he's directly connected to live alkaline water, and there's such a movement going on that I wasn't aware of, that I want to make you aware of, that our people are getting healthy. Our people are getting stronger and we are getting educated in so many other areas. And listen, I want you to be a part of what is happening in our community. All is not lost. There's some great things that are going on and I want you to be a part of it. So listen, come back at seven o'clock and be with us here as we have this live interview. It's not going to take long, but I promise you it's going to be powerful and it's going to be worth your while. So listen, it is live at five. We are here and we are out. God bless you. Have an awesome, awesome Wednesday. I'll see you again at seven.